It's in 2008. 17-year-old young man named John Chow from Scottsboro, Alabama, had so radically given his life to Jesus, he began to tell all of his friends he wanted to be known as an apprentice to Jesus. He wanted to be just like his Lord and Savior, so much so that he began to study unreached people groups around the world, people that had never heard the name of Jesus. And in his studies, he came across an island called North Sentinel Island, and it's in the Bay of Bengal. This is off the coast of India and between India and Southeast Asia. I think you'll see a map and some photos there. Uh, he learned about this place and the people that inhabit that island called the Sentinelese. The Sentinelese. And what he learned is still true to this very day. They are considered to be uh, one of, if not the most remote, unreached people on the planet. So much so that through centuries they have lived on that island, they don't leave the island, and anyone who tries to come to the island, they kill. And they have lived this way for hundreds of years. And when John Chow, at 17 years old, heard about this place and this people that had never heard the name of Jesus, he said, God, one day, send me there. And he wasn't so brash in that he just bought a plane ticket and decided to go for it in the moment. Over the next 10 years, he went to Bible school. He started doing language studies. He began to take cold showers only because he knew there was no electricity and no running water on the island, and he wanted to condition himself. He began, he got certified to be an EMT so that while he was learning their language, he would be able to meet their tangible needs so that they would recognize he's for them and that he was there to serve them. He went and got LASIK eye surgery as a young man because he thought, you know, I won't be able to change out my contact lenses if I'm living on a remote island with the people that don't have any access to modern medicine. By November of 2018, he had done all of these things and he started his journeys and he made it to the Andaman Islands, which are right there beside North Sentinel Island. And he took a battery of vaccines and quarantined himself for 11 days to ensure that he didn't accidentally bring any diseases to this people that had no contact with the outside world. Incredible stuff. And at 26 years old, John Chow got some local fishermen to sneak him to the island because the nation of India has blocked it. They don't allow anybody to go because they don't want more people to be killed and they don't want the, the Sentinelese to catch disease. He got some local fishermen to carry him to the island and he would take a kayak and he would go from the fisherman's boat to the seashore, to the, to the uh, coast of the island. And as he would paddle, he would say, my name is John. I love you and Jesus loves you. And he would paddle around, and the next day he would go. On the second day he got on the island, a young boy fired an arrow at him, and it hit him in his Bible that he was holding. Pierced the Bible, and as he opened it, he wrote in his journal, when he opened the Bible, the tip of the arrow was stopped at Isaiah 65, verses 1 and 2. Here's what it says. I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am to a nation that was not called by my name. I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices. On the third day, the third visit on that kayak, he told the fishermen, let me go ashore, leave me be, come back and check on me tomorrow. The very next day, the fishermen came, and they found John Chow's body on the beach. Ten years of preparation, fasting, prayer, a heart for these people. He didn't last one night in his first night there. But can I tell you something? What he did for the sake of the gospel will echo in eternity for generations to come. In the final pages of his journal that the fishermen recovered, he said this, I pray that you, my friends and family, will never love anything in this world more than you love Jesus Christ. When the news began to circulate around the world that uh, 
uh, young adult, misguided adventurer had gone to a forbidden island. He was criticized. He was made fun of. People were arrested. People in his missions organization were harassed because of the lack of his sensitivity. I'll show you a 90-second video clip from the news. Uh, this is November of 2018. An American missionary who loved the outdoors, John Allen Chow often documented his adventures on Instagram. But these photos would be his last. Authorities say the 26-year-old was killed, possibly by bow and arrow, on what police described as a misplaced adventure in a highly restricted area to a remote island east of India in the Andaman Sea. He was trying to meet and convert the Centilanese, an endangered tribe photographed here in 2004 that's been isolated for centuries and rejects contact with outsiders who might expose them to disease. According to journals and emails published by the Washington Post, Chow attempted to reach the tribe by boat in the days before his death, but was shot at with an arrow, which pierced his waterproof Bible. He wrote to family, you guys might think I'm crazy in all this, but I think it's worthwhile to declare Jesus to these people. God, I don't want to die. In a statement shared on his Instagram account, Chow's family wrote, words cannot express the sadness we have experienced about this report. He had nothing but love for the Centilinese people. We forgive those reportedly responsible for his death. This was a dangerous trip both for the missionary and the tribe. It was incredibly dangerous for him and foolhardy thing to have done, but even more dangerous for the Centinelese themselves. They are the most isolated tribe on earth. Tonight, authorities are working to figure out how to recover Chow's remains without further disturbing the tribe. You know, it's amazing to think in, in the news that he was chastised. As a matter of fact, there were many social media memes. You may have seen these. This is only a few years ago. I don't share these to glorify their criticism. I want to make a point, but I'll show you a couple of these. Uh, this is the kind of stuff. The North Centralese said they wanted to have me for dinner. I bet they're firing up the hibachi right now. Repent and let Jesus into your souls. You're without a doubt the worst missionary I've ever heard of. See, here's the truth. When we have a passion to reach people with the love of Jesus, we're not guaranteed to be understood or appreciated or valued. But can I tell you something? History makers are the ones that lay their reputation aside and say, for the love of God and for the love of people, I will go. And I believe John Chow is a history maker and someone that we should be grateful for. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to turn to Numbers chapter 25, the book of Numbers. It's in the Old Testament first, five books of the Bible. Numbers 25. And if I haven't met you yet, my name is Nathan. I get the privilege of serving on staff here at the refuge. And it's a privilege to be in the house of God, to share God's word with you today, and to have our pastor back from all of his journeys. And just so grateful that you're here today, or those of you that are watching online, so grateful that we get a chance to do this together. We've been in a series over the last several weeks that has been dynamic called History Makers. And we're identifying different characters throughout the scriptures, some that you'll be very familiar with, some you may not be as familiar with, but the point is we're recognizing their contribution to the story of God's love in the universe and in the history of the world. But most importantly, we're showing how they point to the greatness of our God who loves you with an everlasting love. And today, I'm going to be highlighting a character named Phineas. Phineas and uh, we're going to see a little bit about him in Numbers 25. I started with the story of John Chow, which is obviously very sobering and challenging, but it'll integrate with some of the things we're going to talk about today because John Chow had a zeal for the Lord and he had a jealousy for God to receive glory from people that didn't know him. He wanted so much for Jesus to receive the reward of his suffering and inheritance from every nation, tribe, and tongue. And I believe God wants to stir our hearts to zeal for his name and jealousy for him to receive his reward. If you've got Numbers 25, would you stand? Uh, I'm going to read this together. We're going to read the first 13 verses. While Israel lived in Shittim, 
the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, take all the chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun before the Lord, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, each of you kill those of his men who have yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor. And behold, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel while they were weeping in the entrance of the tent of meeting. When Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose and left the congregation, took a spear in his hand and went after the man of Israel into the chamber, pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. Thus the plague on the people of Israel was stopped. Nevertheless, those who died by the plague were 24,000. And the Lord said to Moses, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned back my wrath from the people of Israel in that he was jealous with my jealousy among them so that I did not consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. Therefore say, behold, I give to him my covenant of peace and it shall be to him and to his descendants after him, the covenant of a perpetual priesthood, because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. Let's make the declaration we make every single week. Are you ready? Go. I will hide this word in my heart that I might not sin against God. This word is life to my body and health to my bones. I will be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. And I'm confident of this, that he who has begun a good work in me will complete it in Jesus' name. Give your neighbor a high five. Say, I know it's heavy, but it's going to get better, okay? Today, I want to highlight the history maker Phineas, as found in Numbers 25. And many of you will be familiar with Phineas's name, unfortunately, probably because of a cartoon. Um, and uh, yes, that is the same name, Phineas, and his brother, uh, his stepbrother, Ferb. That's not what I'm talking about today, but I had a strong feeling that enough of you were going to be sending memes to each other that I needed to go ahead and just own it. Yes, his name is Phineas. So who is Phineas? Who is the Baal of Peor? Why in the world are people grabbing spears and, and stabbing people? And why is God proud of it? This is intense stuff. And just like John Chow's story can be very easily misunderstood or criticized, Numbers 25 is often easily misunderstood and criticized. But I think there's so much for us to glean that God would have us glean. But it does require a little bit of a backstory. You know, in, in Jewish synagogues around the world, they read through the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. They have portions of readings every single weekend. And our friend Scott Volk with Together for Israel does a podcast called Portions, where they take the, the Torah portion that's being taught that weekend, and he shares and teaches on it. I get a chance to help him with that from time to time. He did this message this weekend on his podcast, and so I would encourage you to check it out because this past weekend that we're in, starting Friday night on, on the Hebrew calendar, uh, this is the portion of Scripture that's being read in synagogues all around the world. So I thought it would be fascinating to join with the Jewish people and consider the life of Phineas. You have to remember the book of Numbers is the wanderings of the Hebrew people, the Israelites, through the wilderness on their way to the promised land. They exited Egypt, exodus, that's what it means to exit, and they're wandering 40 years, wandering through the wilderness to get to the promised land. And I'll just say that quickly, that's a, a very pedestrian summary of the book of Numbers, and read the book of Numbers, it's fascinating. It's fa Some of my favorite stories in the Old Testament are in the book of Numbers, and I want to say this as well. If you find yourself waiting for a promise to be fulfilled and you feel like it's far off and you feel like you're going in circles, the book of Numbers will encourage you because that's exactly what happened to the Hebrew people and yet God was still bringing them into their promise. You don't have to feel like you're on your way to be on your way. So I want to encourage you today with that. So 
who are these people? What's going on? Well, we back up just a touch before we launch into this, because I think context is key. In the chapters just before this episode, we have what's called the curse of Balaam and Balak. Who are these people? Balak is the king of Moab, and he and the Midianites are in, in cahoots together. But the king of Moab, he hires a sorcerer, false prophet, one versed in the occult, to come pronounce a curse on Israel as they're coming towards the promised land because he doesn't want them to conquer their land. And he hires this sorcerer, this false prophet, to come stand on the mountain and curse. And I just remind you, your words have power. And the enemy understands that to the point that they'll hire people to speak curses You need to remember this. But God in his sovereignty had already proclaimed a blessing over Israel. So every time Balaam went to curse them, he would speak blessings. As a matter of fact, Balaam prophesied the Messiah. If you read Numbers, it's unbelievable. Every time he tried to curse Israel, a blessing was put in his mouth. And he would proclaim a blessing. I want to show you this in Numbers 22, 4 4 through 6, super quick. So Balak, the son of Zippor, who was the king of Moab at the time, sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the earth, and they're dwelling opposite me. Come now, curse this people for me, since they are too mighty for me. See, the enemy knows that in the Lord, we're too mighty for him. So he's reaching for everything he can get, right? Right? Come now, curse this people for me since they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them from the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed and whom you curse is cursed. That's Balak speaking to this false prophet, Balaam. And the Bible takes this curse and this man, Balaam, very serious. As a matter of fact, he shows up in Scripture 309 times. In eight different books of the Bible, including the books of 2 Peter, Jude, and Revelation. As a matter of fact, in Revelation 2.14, when Jesus is speaking to the church at Pergamum, he says this, But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. Now see, we learn something here in Revelation and actually later in the book of Numbers that wasn't revealed to us in Numbers 25. We're going to go back and look, but I'm giving you some context. Obviously, the curses didn't work because Israel moved forward, but Revelation and Numbers 31 tells us that that wasn't the only strategy Balaam used. Balaam told the king, Balak of Moab, he said, well, these curses aren't working, but I tell you what might work. Have your women seduce these men through sexual immorality, and it will yoke them with a false god, and they will erode from the inside out. That, you know, the word occult means secret. Balaam told Balak a secret. It's not even recorded for us in Numbers 25. It's recorded elsewhere. And he says, here's the key. Here's how you get them. Here's how you yoke them. You know what a yoke is? It goes across the neck of the animals that pulls a cart right? And that yoke is supposed to be in unity and it pulls you in a direction. That's why Jesus says, if anyone's heavy laden, burdened, let me have your heavy burden. Take my yoke upon you. It's easy. My burden, it's light. Because these other yokes, these other burdens, they're heavy. And Balaam led Balak and the Moabites to try to snare the people of Israel because he couldn't curse them, but if he could use them to turn against God, he knew he had them. Are you hearing what I'm saying today? We're almost done with this introduction. Okay, are you feeling okay? So, Baal of Peor, that's what it's called, this God. It's going to yoke them to the Baal of Peor. Baal is a word that just means Lord or Master, and ironically, in many translations, it is translated as husband. 
Keep that in mind. Peor just means opening or vista. It's a mountain. And the Baal of Peor just means the Lord of the mountain. And that's where Balaam and Balak were pronouncing the curse. But the Baal of Peor has a, another name, also known as Chemosh. That is the name of their God in Moab. And Chemosh means subduer, conqueror. And he was trying to yoke the people of God to a subduer so that they would not inherit the promise after 40 years of wandering. you got to recognize they've been wandering 40 years in the desert. This is the last stop before they enter the promised land. This is the context. Is that helpful for you? Numbers 25. So who's Phinehas? Well, the Bible tells us here in Numbers 25, he's the son of Eleazar, who was the son of Aaron the priest. So he is of a priestly lineage. That's very important for some of the things we're going to talk about because this passage of Scripture gets criticized as being violent and intolerant and unnecessary. And see, God's not a God of love. He's congratulating this guy that ran a man and a woman through with a spear. And at face value, you could say, now that does sound kind of rough. i got to be honest with you. In the same way people could hear about a young adult going to an island who just doesn't care about these people enough. They don't tell the backstory that for 10 years he prepared himself to do everything he could to be a blessing. And they still killed him. See, Numbers 25 is not saying, here's the way we deal with sinners. Grab a spear and charge. You know? That's not the heart of God. That's not the heart of the scriptures. Phineas is a judge. He's a priest. He's of the lineage of the priests. What has Moses just done? He gave a command. God says, this is going to bring a reproach on all of Israel, not just these men that are making this decision. Because the, the Bible tells us these men were leaders. And he tells the priests, you've got to expel this because it's going to destroy my inheritance. And Phineas is authorized. He's not just some guy. That's very, very important. And God had given a directive. That's as much context as I can give you before you fall asleep. So let's just jump in. Three ways that I believe we can draw parallels from Phineas as a history maker and example. First thing I want to draw out is that Phineas separated himself from the crowd. Look at verse 6 and 7. And behold, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel while they were weeping in the entrance of the tent of meeting. Stop. They've just exposed sexual immorality in the camp. It's Israelite men fornicating with Moabite women. And it's not just, this is not just uh, pr promiscuity. This is promiscuity with the purpose of bringing worship to a false god. And while Moses and the people are weeping, saying, oh God, please don't bring judgment on us. And a plague has started killing people because of judgment. This Israelite man grabs a Midianite woman, the very one that they're in sin with, and parades her in front of Moses and everybody else. And walks into his tent, and it wasn't to play cards. Hello? Let's just be real, okay? It says... And he paraded in front of all of them. Whew. We think what Phineas does is intense. How about the restraint of our God that doesn't just say, you know what, I'm done with all of this. When Phineas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose and he left the congregation. You know, we need community. I'm big on community. Guys, we will not make it without each other. But oftentimes we have to turn away from the crowd. And there's a big difference. Phineas was passionate for his God and for his community. But in order to operate in what God was doing in his heart, he had to separate himself from the crowd. He sees what everyone else sees. And while everyone is there weeping, and there's a place for weeping, and we don't want to dismiss that for a second, but Phineas said, see, I've seen too much. I've seen too much. you got to remember, his grandfather is Aaron the priest. 
And if you read the book of Numbers, there's been rebellion after rebellion. So much so, just a few chapters ago, Korah, another one of the priests, rebels against Moses and against God, and the earth opens up and swallows them. Let me just tell you something. You want good reading? Read the book of Numbers, guys. This is serious stuff. And a plague breaks out, and, and Phineas's grandfather, Aaron, runs and gets the incense and waves it in the middle of the plague, and God's judgment is stayed because he was looking for someone who cared enough to stand in the gap. But see, Phineas saw that. Maybe some of his friends were those that got swallowed. Maybe some of his friends were those that died in the plague. A little bit after that, Miriam and Aaron, they start having a rebellion, and it causes an upheaval again. Listen, the story of the people of Israel is our story. We just can't stay on the road, right? We're just like, well, the Lord's good, but you know, this looks kind of cool, and we go over here, and then we get ourselves in a mess, and it's God's continual mercy that brings them back. And it's God's mercy in our lives that brings us back. But God's heart was moved, and I think this is a key element, by a man named Phineas who said, I've seen enough. I've seen too much. I can't stand back and watch my people be yoked again into bondage. We were slaves for 400 years. We just got out of slavery we are on our way to the promised land. We are almost there. We can't let this happen now. Phineas separated himself from the crowd. John Chow separated himself from the crowd. He said, I know there's a lot of people that are sad about there's people groups around the world that have never heard the name of Jesus. He's like, but I'm going to be one that goes and tells them. He separated himself from the crowd, not saying they're all bad. He's saying, but I just can't sit idly by. History makers must be willing to stand out from the crowd. Remember the stakes. Verse 1 through 3, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to the Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. This is not a bad habit. This is not a bad day. This is spiritual warfare of the highest degree to hook the people of God. And can I tell you something? Sexual immorality is a gateway to idolatry. It is anti-covenant. And I want you to hear me with all the love I can muster in my heart. I am sick of families being torn apart because of pornography, because of promiscuity. Listen to me. It is a hook. This is not child's play. This is not, well, it's art. I've been told that. I've been told that. It's two consensual adults. So much I've got to be careful not to say. How broken do you have to break someone down before they'll consent to anything? How many years of abuse and brokenness? so that we can sit on our high horse and say, well, look, people can make their own decisions. Can I tell you something? It's a hook in your mouth. The stakes are so high. And let's have mercy and compassion for those who are weak and are struggling it's different to be weak and struggling than to be advocating and given to something. Is your home a safe place for your spouse or your child to confess they have a struggle? Is it a safe place? Because if it's not, they're never going to bring it to the light. And we need them to bring it to the light, not so they get in trouble, so they get free. Get free. 
Phineas was not so much mad at these people as he was brokenhearted for God. He says, because this is your inheritance. This is what you want. And we're ruining it. And he said, I can't sit and watch anymore. Let me just remind you, nuclear energy powers homes for people all over cities and all over parts of the globe. And a nuclear bomb will destroy people for generations. Both are nuclear. It's the way it's handled, and it's the intent that makes a difference in what it brings about. God's design for sexuality is to literally be life-giving in every sense of the word. Between a husband and a wife, a man and a woman under God's covering, and in that place, it brings natural life, it brings relational life, and that's what it's designed to do. It is not bad, gross, yucky, sick, it is God's design, and I hate when the church screws this up and starts making it feel like it's a bad thing. It's a blessing from God when it's in the place it belongs. So hear my heart today. This is not judgment towards anyone who's weak or struggling, but do you know the number of people I counsel that don't even know? And this is, when I say this, this is not like, I'm not angry, I'm, I'm brokenhearted. What's my role? What's my role? When, when, when young people, really, age is irrelevant, don't even know that God's design is that we should be absent and until the day we get married. They don't even know that. Our culture's not gonna teach our kids, everybody. They're not going to teach them. We have to teach them the word of God and not be heavy-handed and demanding, but say, let love motivate you because it's life-giving. And if you found yourself struggling in any way, there's hope and life and love for you today. But let's not go backwards. Let's go forward in the love of Jesus. It says in verse 8 through 9, he went after the man of Israel into the chamber and pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. You don't have to do a lot of math to recognize the situation they were in where one spear would get both of them. That's what's happening in front of Moses and all of the people, and most importantly, in front of God who has just said, this very thing is destroying my people. And Mr. Man and this thing, Go right in front of everybody and just say, so? God help us all. God help us all. Thousands had already died from a plague that would come out because of their sin. It says that Phineas was made jealous with my jealousy. That's what God says. It doesn't just say Phineas was emotional doesn't say that Phineas had a rah-rah moment, that he wanted attention. It says that he felt what God was feeling. And he's like, and it shouldn't be this way. And I can't let more people die. It's not just about this one person. Remember, this, these are leaders. If you read the rest of the chapter, this man is a leader in Israel, and this woman is a leader in, in Moab. This is about trying to make a statement that we condone this behavior and it's okay. And Phineas says, but it breaks the heart of God and it destroys the people. You know, the word jealous in Hebrew is kano. We look at some definitions, hostile towards a rival or one believed to enjoy an advantage. The Bible tells us very clearly our God is a jealous God. But he's not a petty jealous God. He's not upset because you got new shoes and you, he likes your shoes more than he likes his own shoes. It's not petty jealousy. He knows that he's the best thing for us and he is desirous for us to know the goodness that he alone offers for us. It's intolerant of rivalry or unfaithfulness. It's vigilant in guarding a possession. I thank God that he's jealous because that means he fights for me. I thank God for that because I need him 
to fight for me. History makers must be jealous for God to have his inheritance. Here's the last idea, the third idea. Phineas took action for the sake of the people. Phineas wasn't trying to get his name on employee of the month sign. He wasn't trying to make it into the scriptures. Well, I bet if I do something bold here, I might, they might write this down. Moved by the heart of God and moved on behalf of the people that are dying and being hooked into slavery and bondage. Verse 11 through 13, he was jealous with my jealousy among them so that I did not consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. Therefore say, behold, I give to him, speaking of Phinehas, my covenant of peace, and it shall be to him and to his descendants after him the covenant of a perpetual priesthood because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. Phinehas took action. He was willing to be misunderstood. And to this day, if you look at commentaries and people's thoughts on this passage of Scripture online, you'll be entertained by all the different thoughts. People that completely take it out of context and say, see, this is why you can't trust Christians. They're, they're these zealous, you know, they're stabbing people. They're condoning this kind of stuff. This is a leader who was given an assignment in a specific situation at a time in Israel. Nowhere does it say, and here's how I want you to do things moving forward. Nowhere does the Bible say, and this is how my stamp of approval. Every time you run into somebody, nowhere does it say any of those things. It's showing us a picture of the zeal of the Lord that has a heart to please God and a heart to see people not be brought into slavery through bondage. Scripture makes clear zeal without wisdom is foolish. So if this was zeal without wisdom, God would not reward it. He wouldn't. But in this case, he does. To love deeply requires great vulnerability. John Chow loved a people he had never even met before. And he opened himself up to ridicule and shame and ultimately death at age 26. Why? Because love compelled him. Love should cause us to be vulnerable, to not consider our reputation. Here's what C.S. Lewis said in his book, The Four Loves. To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable impenetrable, irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. Phineas loved his God and he loved his neighbors enough to say, I cannot let this continue. We just got out of slavery. We've rebelled against God. How many times is he going to be merciful? We cannot behave this way. He's holy. He's called us to be a holy people. We cannot live this way. And it was love for God and love for people, which Jesus said is the greatest commandment. Which is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he says, and the second's just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is what Phineas demonstrates. And as a result, he inherits a covenant of peace. And I believe God wants to mark all of us with his peace. Isn't that amazing? What seems to be such a violent narrative, God's reward is a covenant of peace. If we will not play with the enemy's plans, we will take serious our righteousness before God because of his great love. He'll give us a covenant of peace. History makers are motivated by love as God defines love. 
and are given his peace. I believe God will bless you with a covenant of peace if you'll separate yourself from the crowd. If you'll be moved by the heart of God. And if you'll take action for the sake of the people, not so you look holy, not so you look more spiritual, but willing to be misunderstood for the sake of protecting the next generation. Do you know what happens in the next chapter of Numbers? You're all going to find out because you're going to read Numbers this week. I'm so proud of you. I really challenge you. Read the book of Numbers. The next chapter, they take a census. God says, take a census of all the people. You know why that's important? Because earlier on in the book of Numbers, God told them to send 12 spies and to spy out the land of promise. And when the 12 spies came back, 10 of them said, we can't do it. Can't do it. There's big bad guys out there. They're going to crush us. Two said, but God gave us a promise. We can surely do it. And God said on that day, everyone 20 years old and older at this time, you're all going to die in the wilderness. You're not going to see the promise because you didn't believe me to receive it, except the two that believed me, Joshua and Caleb. Numbers 26, a census is taken. Guess who's no longer there? Every person who was 20 years old or older at the time of the rebellion. And you know what Phineas knows? We can't lose everybody. We can't go into the promised land yoked to a false god because of sexual immorality. We just got out of slavery. We can't go in. Phineas recognizes the next generation is on the line. We must not forget we are marching toward to possess the promise. This week, Pastor Jay told us 150 of our third through fifth graders are going to camp. Can we pray that they won't have to fight the demons that we fought? Can we pray and can we stand up and say, I'm going to ask God to help me cut some things off in my life so that my kids don't inherit it and have to struggle the way that I've struggled. I'm not here to criticize your struggle today, but I'm not here to glorify it. I am here to lift up the name of Jesus, the Son of God, who has the power to set you free from bondage and to take the hook out of your mouth. Would you stand with me today all across the room? I want us to pray. And here's what I want us to do. The Holy Spirit speaking to you, I'm not that good. But if the Holy Spirit spoke to you today and you know there's something that has to be dealt with, I'm not here to define that for you. You know. We're not trying to figure out what that is, but don't miss your moment. I want to encourage you spiritually to take a spear in your heart and say, I'm not leaving this altar till this thing is pinned to the ground because my kids are not going to struggle with it. My, the next generation is not going to battle it. Whatever that looks like for you, I just challenge you. And it's the love of God. It's the love of God that compels us. It's not a finger wag. It's a broken heart of a father that says, would you be jealous with what I'm jealous for? And now, as you come, those you come, just respond as the team sings. We're going to pray over our kids. I'm not sure if Pastor Prabhu and your team are here. Would you guys just come to the altar, just the, the Refuge Kids team? You guys come down here. Some of our leaders, I want you to pray for them. We're going to pray for the next generation, that they would not have to slay the giants that, that we've had to fight, but we're going to ask the Lord to pin it to the ground in Jesus' name. Anyone who needs to respond, would you come? Some of our leaders, would you pray for our kids team that are getting ready to go to camp? Lord God in heaven, we declare that we belong to you. We want to be marked by your love. God, we want a heart for people. God, we want a heart for you that says, I will not compromise. I will not be yoked again into slavery and bondage. Lord, right now, I pray that the love of Jesus would fill this house and hearts would be made soft, not to me, to you, Holy Spirit. And I pray that you would pin this thing to the ground that is trying to hook us, that's trying to keep us in bondage. No, God, we say we're the people of God. We are not perfect. We are not, we are not complete except for your grace in our lives. But Lord, it's trying to hook people into bondage. Set us free. Set 
us free. God, help us separate ourselves from the crowd. Help us, God, to separate ourselves, God, and be able to respond to your love. King Jesus, today, we repent. Come on, wherever you are in this room, you're watching online, you know, you know that the enemy has been trying to hook you in the mouth. Maybe it's sexual immorality, maybe it's something else, but you know your heart's beating in your chest and you're like, today is the day. Today is the day. Pick up the spear, pick it up, and pin this thing to the ground in the zeal of the Lord and submit it to the one who can set you free. God, we come to you in Jesus' name. We pray that you would tear down every stronghold, every stronghold, pierce the darkness, oh God. And Father, where we've sinned, where we've wandered, where we've allowed ourselves to operate in promiscuity or immodesty, God, where we've had coarse joking or we've looked at things on the internet or posted things on social media. God, I pray that not only would we repent, we tear it down. I pray we would delete it. We'd go back. We would cut it off. Whatever we have to do, whatever we have to do, whatever we have to do, fuel us by your spirit, great God, that we would not be yoked to a slavery again. We will not be yoked to a demonic thing. We will be set free by the blood of the Lord, by the blood of the Lamb. And we proclaim these things in Jesus' name. Now, God, we pray for our children that are getting ready to go to kids' camp. God, we just, be, would you stretch your hands towards them? Lord, all of our leaders, God, we pray for these children. God, set a guard before them and behind them. Cover them and keep them. Protect them, we ask. Father, for every leader, for every parent, God, for every counselor, God, we pray for safety, security, Lord, for travel. Lord, we pray that you'd be their counselor in the night. Give them sweet sleep, dreams from heaven, thoughts in the day. Encounter our children. And when they come home, come on, church, when these kids come home, may they find the house swept clean. God, there'd be nothing to bond to bring them into bondage. Pin it to the ground this week, oh God, so that the next generation would inherit the promise. Let them inherit the promise, God, and let us have a front row seat to see it because we will not stand for wickedness in our homes, oh God. We will not stand for a compromise in our spirits. Lord, help us. Help us, oh God. I'm telling you, some of you need to change your habits on social media. Some of you need to delete some accounts. Some of you have some burner accounts. You've got some secret things back there. Let me remind you, the word occult comes from the word secret. The enemy is in the secrets. But God wants to bring you into the secret place to set you free. Get out of the secrets and get into the secret place. Let the Lord set you free because our kids are on the line. Come, Holy Spirit, do what only you can do.